This morning, I have a prayer on my heart that I want to begin with. Um, I know like many of y'all, uh, we saw the news last night of a presidential candidate getting shot. It captivates our minds. It's been a part of most of my conversations this morning. And I believe even though we may have opinions on that, today we can enter this room and never be focused upon Jesus. We can allow outside things to take our mindsets away from the change and the development of our souls that the Lord wants us to focus on. All across our nation today from pulpits, people will hear sermons about how to stand behind their politician or another. I will tell you this from my heart to yours. I've never had a politician save my soul. There's never been one. I encourage you to make today a change to your prayer life that you pray for every politician. Whether you vote for them or not, whether they're on the other side of the political spectrum from you or not. It is the obligation of the church to pray for those that we love and dislike alike. And when we find ourselves praying one side and not the other, the enemy has had his win. His shot has hit. Today, I want to pray before we start that the Lord would focus us in on him and him alone. And that our time will be spent today with our whole attention being upon the one who saves, the one who gives life, the one who is alive and well, and the one who desires to save you from this lost world. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, may you win our attention. May you be captivating in this moment. May we never forget why we are here. It's not to check a box. Lord, it's not even because we should go to church. It's because you are here. And where the presence of the Lord is, Scripture tells us there is freedom and, Lord, how we need it. So, Lord, we pray that you would break the affliction, the chains of sin, the fears, the doubts, every part of what the enemy has brought into our life. We pray that you would break free from us and distance us from it. Lord, that your presence would fall in this room and we would notice the difference. Lord, may you breathe fresh life into us. And may we take to a lost world that which they cannot grasp of. But Lord, you've sent us to give them. That is Jesus. Lord, may Jesus win this moment. Jesus, would you speak? Would you invest in us this morning, your truth? May you hide this broken, sinful pastor and show yourself instead. Lord, we pray this in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Costa Concordia was a ship like no other. Its port was that of Italy. And in 2012, the Concordia set out from its port in Rome for a seven-night cruise. In an attempt for the boat to come close like it often did, to wave and blow its horn at one of the ports as it went by. The captain, Francisco, um, directed the boat to go close to the shoreline. And the problem was they overcorrected. This boat, the Concordia, with over 4,000 people on board, hit rocks underneath water and began to sink. Once They began to see the demise of the boat. The captain went over the loudspeaker and simply told the people not to panic. Everything was okay. That was until the Concordia began to lean 45 degrees, at which point they rang out that everybody should go to uh, their side of the boat that they were told to go to in case of emergency to put on their life vests. And they began to take lifeboats off of the Concordia. The problem was... On one side of the boat, those boats were inoperable. The captain believed that there was time, that the boat would simply brush onto the shoreline enough that they could almost climb out of it. As night fell, um, people began to get on boat after boat as much as they could. Panic had ensued, 
And the lifeguards, those on the side of the boat from the shoreline, began to come out to sea. And they radioed the captain, Captain Francisco, who was on the shoreline. He had left the boat. He had left the boat while thousands of passengers were still on board, believing he could do nothing else to save them. And so he saved himself. Those of y'all that read the news line in 2012, you realize that Captain Francisco is in prison today because there were several people that did not make it off the Concordia. The overcorrection was terrible in nature and it could have been avoided. I tell you this story because I believe that in our life there's always rocks. And there is absolutely a way that you and I can keep from sinking in this world. But I want you to know something to keep from sinking, you have to get a new captain. This should have been avoided. And any good captain that reviewed the tapes of the Concordia said that Captain Francisco simply was negligent. And let me just tell you about your life. You're a negligent captain. You don't have what it takes to lead your own life. We need help. And the help we need will keep us not only from the rocks, it'll keep you from the icebergs that are right in front of you. It'll keep you from the moments that you should have avoided. But too often we believe that we have everything it takes to navigate our lives on our own. Let's be reminded today as we read in Psalms 119, if you want to open your Bibles there, we began last week with walking through the the vocabulary of what we're going to read. And today, if you want to look at the screen, here's that vocabulary again. Now, remind yourself that when you read the Hebrew alphabet, you read it backwards as though we have it right and they had it wrong. Um, They preempted us, by the way. I think they've done it better. Remember, we talked last week that there is some things like the the gesh, these dots that change the letters into the sound. Either it's open mouth or it's breathy, like you're blowing air out of your mouth. The other thing I want to tell you today is as we go through this alphabet, we're going to start with a letter that in this particular way of pronouncing the letters is frankly incorrect. Um, The reason is this. What you're seeing in front of you is the Latin version of how to really pronounce some of these words. Um, When we get to the va, um, really it would be more like a wa, like a W. Uh, The V is very Latin in nature, so we get that kind of pronunciation. So in your Bibles, if yours is like mine, it reads W-A-W, like wa, wa. (laughs) I always think that's funny, wa, wa. Um, But really think in terms of like opening your mouth and trying to say a W, wa, (laughs) right? But that's what this would be. Then we get to the Zayin, to the Het, to the Tet, to the Yod. Uh, That's where we're going to be today in our vocabulary for reading. And we're going to begin reading in verse 41. Psalms 119, verse 41. I want you to keep, by the way, the Concordia, that boat on your mind as we read through these five stanzas of understanding. Each week as we read through these, we will read one of the letters in this alphabet, and then we'll pause for reflection. So we did that last week. We're going to do it again this week. Verse 41, let your faithful love come to me, Lord, your salvation as you promised. Then I can answer the one who taunts me, for I will trust in your word. Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I hope in your judgments. I will always obey your instruction forever and ever. I will walk freely in an open place because I study your precepts. I will speak of your decrees before kings and not be ashamed. I will delight in your commands, which I love. I will lift up my hands to your commands, which I love. I will meditate on your statutes. The only way that you and I will walk in freedom, and this is true freedom, is to obey God's word. That day when the Concordia was coming close to the shoreline, the maps, the navigational maps that they used showed where those rocks were. They were already there. They already knew that they were in place. They never moved. 
But that day, the boat decided to come closer than ever in order as though to show off and say, look how close we got. And this is what sin's gonna do to us, church. Sin is gonna tell you that you can get this much closer and you're gonna be okay. Only to find out that you and I, remember, we're poor navigators. We're poor navigators and we will get too close and in that closeness, ruin will happen in our lives. We must hold on to the truth of God's word because it lays out before us the navigational maps of life. It shows us where the rocks are going to appear in your life. Make no mistake, the Bible is equally God speaking into you as it is giving you the foretelling of what happens when we allow sin to be our directors. Every time you get on a cruise ship, you're given a cruise director. This cruise director is kind of the person that tells you everything that's gonna happen every day. And in the mornings over your stateroom, you hear instructions like, hey, everybody, how you doing? This is your cruise director. You can go do yoga this morning, or you can just eat again, whichever you decide, and I choose eating. But they also say, and here's what's happening throughout the day. This is when you get off the boat today. They give you all the instructions you need. Now, if you follow those instructions, Your cruise is exceptional. But if you don't listen, you always wonder what may happen that day. What's more is every day they give you this little brochure, and it gives you all the times of things happening that day. But if you don't read that instruction, you have no clue what may happen in those moments. See, God's given us his word, and he's put it right in front of us, and he brings us into moments like this where we gather as the church, and you need somebody in your life group teaching and from pulpits that tell you the truth of God's word, because when they do, it helps you to enjoy the life God has for you. Problem. We live in a society where people on Instagram and YouTube and whatever social media you're on can tell you what God says and it not be from the Lord. And if you're not careful, you will believe an untruth and make it a a core piece of your belief system. That's a true problem. Well, how do you avoid that, Pastor? You spend time in the Word. The more time you spend in the Word, the more often when you hear people speaking of God's Word, you'll be able to discern what's truth and what's not. It happens readily the more time that we spend in God's word, you're going to uncover how many people are just saying what they think instead of what God says. I find it fascinating when I go online and I listen to people speak with authority even of what God says about any particular thing. And at some point they will say, I know that you thought that said this. But what God really says is this. And anytime you hear what God really says and it's not from the scriptures, it's a pretty good indicator that it's from them. Listen, that's why our lost world doesn't understand Jesus. Because there has been a lot of people saying Jesus things without it being Jesus' breath. And so how can they believe in one that sounds so evil, unloving, unkind, judgmental. Well, see, my Jesus comes and says, go and sin no more. He still says that. So nowhere does my Jesus say, live how you want to live. It's okay. I'm Jesus. In fact, our society says this, Jesus, hang with me, forgives it all. And he does, but you can't keep living in sin and think you've been saved from it. This is a trouble. Psalms 119, verse 41. We cannot live in freedom without God's word. John 14, 21, this is Jesus talking, says this, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I also will love him and reveal myself to him. This is a core truth in the Christian life. If you want to experience Jesus, you need to follow his commands. When you do so, he will reveal himself more and more to you in your life. Everybody wants Jesus to appear on stage so they will believe deeply. Let me just flip that for you. 
the more you obey Christ and follow after him and keep his commands, he will appear more and more in your life. Amen. I promise you that. That is not, it doesn't even have to be my promise. John 14, 21 tells us that. And Jesus keeps his promises. Amen. Verse 49, remember your word to your servant. You have given me hope through it. This is my comfort in my affliction. Your promise has given me life. The arrogant constantly ridicule me, but I do not turn away from your instruction. Lord, I remember your judgments from long ago and find comfort. Fury seizes me because of the wicked who reject your instruction. Your statutes are the theme of my song during my earthly life. Lord, I remember your name in the night and I obey your instruction. This is my practice. I obey your precepts. I, I hope you do something. I I underline in my Bible, if you do that in your Bible, I think Psalm 119 verse 56 is underlinable. This is my practice. I obey your precepts. Man, that should be our daily prayer. Lord, this is what I want to be my practice, that I obey your precepts. Look at verse 50 with me. It says, this is my comfort in my affliction. Your promise has given me life. Amen. Our comfort is not without affliction. In fact, Scripture tells us that we are comforted for one reason. Do you remember what it says? We're comforted that we might comfort others. It doesn't say we're comforted that we would never face affliction again. That is not the state of the Christian life. You are not saved from discomfort. You're saved from sin. Amen. In this life, you will have trouble, but what happens? Jesus has, he's overcome it all. He's the overcomer. So you may face trials, you may face illness, you may face discomfort, you may face loss, you may face it all, but this is momentary in our affliction. Amen. We may be pushed down, perplexed, even to the point of feeling crushed, but we have a victor in Christ. Amen. We hold on to him. It is why Christians can deal with grief so differently. We don't live in death. We live in life. We live in life because he gives it to us, and it is a promise from him. Amen. This life is a promise of God. Even in our afflictions, we hold on to life. When I was a kid in high school, my high school principal was one of our worship guys. So that was always awesome. High school principal also got to lead you in worship. So if I acted up at school, I also got to see him on Sunday singing to me about Jesus. That's fun. But I was a perfect kid. Don't say anything. <laughs> but he used to sing a song often at church for a special. Um... But there was another man in our church, one of my best friend's dads. And he would sing, usually at funerals, the same song every time. It's called The Lighthouse. I'll never forget his voice. I can still hear it in my mind. The words say this, there's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks the sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out light that I might see. And that light that shines in darkness now will safely lead us o'er. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, my ship would be no more. It seems that every one of us, everyone about us says, tear that lighthouse down. The big ships don't pass by this way anymore, so there's no use for it standing around. And when my mind goes back to that one dark night, one dark stormy night, when just in time I saw the light. Yes, it was the light from that old lighthouse that stands up there on that hill. And I thank God for that lighthouse. I owe my life to him. Jesus is that lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I might clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, tell me, where would this ship be? Amen. In our lives, we need a guiding light. And the problem truly resides in the fact that we tend to think that when affliction sets in, there is nothing we can do. Oh, but church, turn your eyes to the lighthouse. It's always going to be there. For those that are in Christ, that light shines continuously. 
even in our darkest moments. Verse 57 says, the Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. I have sought your favor with all of my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. I thought about my ways and turned my steps back towards decrees. I hurried, not hesitating to keep your commands. Though the ropes of the wicked were wrapped around me, I did not forget your instruction. I rise at midnight to thank you for your righteous judgments. I'm a friend to all who fear you, to those who keep your precepts. Lord, the earth is filled with your faithful love. Teach me your, your, teach me your statutes. For the Lord to be your portion, you must be a child of God. Amen. Being a portion does not mean a peace. This portion in Scripture means to gain inheritance from. Jesus talks about those who place their trust in Christ as sons and daughters of God, which means that you are not simply a bystander. You're not even somebody that he rescued just from the waters dripping with sin. No, when you put your hope and trust in Christ, you become his child. And we would do anything for our children, wouldn't we? Don't you know that as good of a dad or a mom as you could possibly be, God is better. He loves you desperately. He loves you so much that he knows your affliction and he's made a way for you to have life. He knows that the world will sometimes wrap its ropes around you, but he gives you a reason to stand and praise. When you're a child of God, you don't live like the world does. You can't. All this world has to offer us is affliction and death. Oh, but he has come that you would have life and have it in abundance. Amen. When I was a kid, I used to collect sports cards. It was a good default for my parents. They could, at different occasions, buy me just packs of cards. And man, I loved it. I loved unwrapping them. Remember that nasty bubble gum that used to come in it? That always bleached that one card? That was awful. What were they thinking? Anyways, by the way, did anybody ever eat that gum that it was pliable? No, it always came out like they just stole it from the chalkboard, right? You had to break it and then add saliva to make it. Anyways, terrible decision sports cards. Anyways, I loved it, and I had a good collection. And then I started making friends in school, and I started to realize with all the cards I had, they had more. And I always thought, what's up, Mom and Dad? Y'all don't love me as much as their parents? Then I started to realize my parents loved me more than their parents. They just didn't give me that many cards Um, because I met their parents. Awful. Thanks, y'all. Anyways, you're going to see in this life lost people that may seem like they have more joy than you. You're going to see lost people that walk far from God, and they may look like they have more giftedness than you. You're going to see lost people in your life, and they're going to seem like they have more peace than you. But rest assured, when you see that, look at their father. Because if they don't know Christ, their father is the enemy. And he does not love them like your dad loves you. In time, their joy will fade because they can't have it without Christ. It will seem like their peace, even though they feel like they have it, they do not because you can only find peace in Christ. And while they may accumulate giftedness, I assure you of this, it will be short-lived because every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. It will all fade in time, but your dad loves you. Look to your father. Find your portion in him. Verse 65, Lord, you have treated me, your servant, well, just as you had promised. Teach me good judgment and discernment. That's another good prayer, by the way, church. For I rely upon your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You are good. And you do what is good. Teach me your statutes. The arrogant have smeared me with lies, but I obey your precepts with all my heart. 
Their hearts are hard and insensitive, but I delight in your instruction. It is good for me to be afflicted so that I may, so I can learn your statutes. Instruct from your lips is better for me than a thousand of gold and silver pieces. We should seek to do what is good because that is what God is. Amen. First Chronicles 16, 34 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is, he is good. His faithful love endures for a moment. How about a season? How about a decade? How about a millennium? Is that what it says? No, his faithful love endures forever. It has no end. His faithful love started before the foundation of the world because God is love. His goodness from before the mountains were formed because God is good. So when we need his love and goodness, we seek him because that's exactly who he is. And that's how we should act. Verse 73, your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding so that I can learn your commands. Those who fear you will see me and rejoice for I put my hope in your word. I know, Lord, that your judgments are just and that you have afflicted me fairly. May your faithful love comfort me as you promised your servant. May your compassion come to me so that I might live for your instruction is my delight. Let the arrogant be put to shame for slandering me with lies. I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you Those who know your decrees turn to me. May my heart be blameless regarding your statutes so that I will not be put to shame. I believe this part of Psalms 119 may be the hardest for two reasons. One is understanding why we go through things in life. The psalmist writes that the Lord afflicts fairly, which would mean that the Lord afflicts. I think sometimes we believe that God has no place in our affliction, and it's simply untrue. But the Lord never brings affliction so that we might sin. The Lord brings change so that we might correct. Like a faithful father who disciplines his children, so does God on his children. Because what dad, when he sees his child out of line, would not offer correction? Yesterday, um, April and I decided to spend a little bit of collateral in treats. So we went to a a local frozen place and got a little dessert. We were sitting down, and as we were sitting there, one of the children in this particular place started doing what unruly children do and just would scream at the top of their lungs for no reason. No one was touching them. Nothing was harming them. They just would scream. Now, I want you to know something. April and I are getting older. And so when, when a child starts in, we want to play that role of, oh, bless them. But we also are at the age where we also say, Lord, bless them and smite their parents. <laughs> Y'all know where I'm at. Y'all know the smite prayer. Um, I wanted the mom in this particular instance to get up and go over and say, stop it. Never happened. Never once. Kid would come close to mom, play around, go to the other side of this particular establishment, scream at the top of their lungs, and then giggle and come back. This happened about, oh, a dozen times. My frozen treats started being less and less treaty. And my soul became less and less unfrozen. I looked at April and I said, you know what? I'm done. And she looked at me and said, me too. We gathered our frozen treats, threw them in the trash, looked at the worker who we knew and went, we're out of here. And they said, please take that kid with you. (laughs) Understandable. Understandable. God does not allow his children to stand in places and scream like the world. He wants you to act like him. So when he sees the world in you, he will correct it. And sometimes that's difficult. 
He doesn't do it because he can, and he can. He does it because he loves, because that's who God is. God is love. And so when he acts on affliction in our life, it is not for our ruin. It's for our correction. But the psalmist ends this particular phrasing with, I believe, a harshness. Because I don't know how many of us want to pray this prayer. Verse 79, let those who fear you, those who know your decrees, turn to me. May my heart be blameless regarding your statutes so that I will not be put to shame. Lord, bring people around me that are your people and cleanse me that when they're around me, I won't bring shame upon your name. Paul, when he writes the letters to the church, says, follow my example, which I think is drastically hard to say. Because I think if we're being honest in this room today, we would say, Lord, make sure that they follow not my example. <laughs> I, I've yet to get this thing right. But shouldn't we pray those kind of prayers? Shouldn't we pray prayers like, Lord, make me a follower after you that would never put you to shame? And that if people are brought before me that are followers of your word, that I might challenge and strengthen their faith because of how I live out your purposes. Amen. It's a difficult prayer, but it's one we should pray. The question we're remaining with today in these phrasings, these five alphabetical letters in the Hebrew um, is this, do people see a noticeable change in your life since you met Jesus? There's a lot of people in scripture that had encounters with Christ and were never changed. Rich young ruler, somebody that walked with Christ, talked to Christ, had a moment with Christ where Christ even applauds his spiritual efforts. And yet he walks away from Christ unchanged. I think we would all like to believe that if we had an encounter with Jesus, we would never be the same. Amen. So did he. How many people in the temple had encounters with Christ and were unchanged? What about Judas? Judas. You see, we'd all like to think that we're the most superior part of this story. But today, you have a moment to have an encounter with Christ. And the sad part about it is there's people in this room that will leave here today being unchanged by him. Amen. And that is simply heartbreaking to me. Amen. When I was seven, I hadn't committed a whole lot of sin. I'd lied, I'm sure. I don't know what else I'd done at seven. I can't remember where I was at 15, much less seven. But man, I needed Jesus at seven. Amen. And so when I gave my life to Christ, I needed him desperately. I'm in my 40s. And man, I need Jesus so much more now. My world is broken. The sin I've committed since seven has been terrible. Too much to list. How about you? Amen. But oh, how faithful God is. Praise God. He has met me every single time I failed him. And every single time has never said, you know what, that sin wasn't that bad, Kyle. Just keep doing it. Never once has he met me and said, you know what? We're good. Instead, he always meets me through Scripture the same way. Amen. That was sin. Go and sin no more. And my blood has covered it. God. Has Jesus changed your life? Not has Jesus met you at a church service, at a camp meeting, or anywhere else. Has Jesus changed your life? Because when he saves you from your sin, he then starts to lead you away from it. And according to scripture, because of him, we can conquer it.
But I don't know many people that have. And that's why we still need him. How desperately we need that lighthouse. How desperately we must stay away from the shoreline and get away from our own leadership of our lives. Today, the rocks have always been there, and they're called sin. There is not one of those rocks that Jesus didn't have to encounter, and he conquered them all. In fact, he went so far as knowing that you and I would hit those rocks. And so he gave his life on a cross at Calvary to save you from those rocky moments. And I will tell you this, when a voice cries out for the captain of your life when you hit rocks, he will always be with you, never a distance, never away, always with you, because that's another one of his promises. Today, have you been changed by Jesus? Do you hunger for his precepts? And I can promise you this, there has never been a person that's hungered for them that hasn't been saved by him. Amen. It's never happened. And so today, if you're reading what the psalmist says in 119, and you say, I want that in my life, today is your day to ask him to forgive your sin. Believe in him. Believe in your heart. And the next thing scripture says is this, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's what we do today. And that may be what you need to do right where you are. Believe in Jesus and who he said he was. Believe that what he did on the cross was sufficient to cover your sin. And next, confess him with your mouth that he is Lord. And let him do what he does. Make him the captain of your boat and never go back. Today, you can do that right here and right now. Do not leave this room without being changed by Christ. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room who are far from you. God, I pray that you would allow them to understand that you are not too far off, that you desperately love every person in this room, every man, woman, boy, and girl, and you desire that they would know you in a relationship. God, that you would save them from their sin and you would lead their life, being the Lord of their life, the captain of their life. Lord, we know that the rocks are ahead. Lord, we know that the world is constantly putting rocks ahead of us, and they want to destroy us, but God, you have come that we would truly live. So God, we ask for that life. We ask that you would change this room, that your spirit would fall fresh, and God, that you would save those who have wandered away. Lord, would you speak in this moment? We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.